So we're going to start talking about art and reality, basically. We're going to talk about some of the different ways to describe and categorize art. So there's three terms, representational, abstract, and non-representational. And those three terms are used to describe an artwork's relationship to the physical world. And typically, each artwork will typically be able to fall in one of these three categories. So we'll start off with kind of talking about representational art. So representational art basically depicts the appearance of things. So it's really straightforward. You know, if I was to draw my hand, it would represent my hand. Um, and it would be a very straightforward process. That would be considered representational art. And when the human form is the primary subject, that is called figurative art. So that kind of falls underneath the umbrella of representational art, but it has its own subcategory if it's the human body. It's called figurative art. And a subject is something that representational arts art has. It's the object that representational art depicts. So if I draw that picture of my hand, the subject will be my hand. So we're going to talk about art and reality a little bit. So Rene and Mag Rene Magritte. Um, this is called The Treachery of Images. It's oil on canvas from 1929. What is the subject of this painting? Well, it's pretty straightforward. It's a pipe, right? So we'll talk about this piece a little bit. This piece was painted by Belgian painter René Magritte, and it's called The Treachery of Images, and it's kind of a commentary on the relationship between art and reality. So the subject of the painting appears to be a pipe, but written underneath the pipe in French are the words, this is not a pipe. And so to the viewer, as the viewer, you might wonder, you know, if this is not a pipe, what is it? So just think about what this is really. Well, the answer is that this is a painting, right? It's not a pipe. And even the t title, The Treachery of Images, kind of relates and hints back to the visual game that the artist is actually playing with this piece. So what do you guys think about the painting? Think about what you think about this piece. Do you understand what the artist is trying to say? What do you think he's trying to say by juxtaposing the juxtaposition of a hyper-realistic pipe over the very matter-of-fact words that say, this is not a pipe? And I feel like the artist is kind of messing with me personally. It's kind of a humorous piece as well. And as I said earlier, I think the artist is really trying to break down the rela relationship between art and reality. You know, do you believe what you see or do you believe what you read? And there's kind of a struggle going on there between that realistic image of the pipe and the very matter of fact message below it that says this is not a pipe because it's a painting, right? And I did create a video, an Ed Puzzle video on Rene Magritte that kind of goes over some of his work. And so remember to complete that when you have time. That will be in content area of week one. So like, as I said, it's a complicated relationship between art and reality. So moving on, abstract art. The verb to abstract means to take form. It means to extract the essence of an object or idea. So abstract works depict natural objects in a very simplified, distorted, or exaggerated ways. And they might actually depict things that have no reference to any natural object out there. But we'll take a look at a pretty famous piece here by Theo van Doesburg. It's the Abstraction of the Cow series from 1917. So in this series of drawings and paintings, we can see the stages of abstraction. And he started off kind of with this rough pencil on paper drawing that slowly is abstracted more and more until it turns into this end painting of a series of colored rectangles and squares. And the artist was really experimenting. He wanted to see how far he could abstract the cow and still have the final image symbolize and capture the essence of the cow. So he definitely used the subject of the cow as a jumping off point 
to create this final piece over here. And if we had seen the only the final painting, we would have had no idea that this was supposed to be representative of a cow. But it's kind of an interesting series. It's a great series of kind of, to be able to really visualize what abstraction means, taking something from reality and slowly, there's different levels of abstraction too, which is nice to see because uh, abstraction does exist on a scale. So some stuff might be slightly abstracted all the way into very, very out there, such as this piece here on the far right. So this is a great piece to look at when talking about abstraction. And then next up, non-representational art, another one of those categories, those three categories. And it, this type of art is not meant to represent anything at all. And so we'll experience non-representational art as being boiled down to really the basic building blocks of art. So things like texture, line, color, shape are going to be really the predominant characteristics that we notice. And there really is no subject to these paintings. So a famous non-representational artist, Carmen Herrera, um, this is one of her pieces from 2010. It's called Yellow and Black. And really, it's just a, an experiment with color strong colors next to each other, the, the gold color and the black color, and experimenting with those two colors next to each other. Some people might say that it kind of resembles a lightning bolt, but that's not really what the artist is trying to do here. She's not trying to represent anything except for colors. It's an experiment with color and line as well. So the lines are all diagonal. None of them are straight up and down, except for maybe the edges of the canvas themselves. But and so those diagonal lines have more dynamicism and movement built into them than, say, a purely vertical or horizontal line would. So it's really just the nature of the line and the colors that she's experimenting with with this piece. And it's a fairly large piece. It's acrylic on canvas. It's 36 by 72 inches, so a fairly large piece. I have a, a video on Cameron Herrera there, but we're going to move on looking and seeing. So looking implies taking in what is before us and, and it's kind of a mechanical or goal oriented way of, of seeing the world. Seeing is actually a more open and receptive and focused version of looking. We look with our memories, imaginations, and our feelings. So hopefully, you know, you can really get versed in this course at really seeing things and being able to see art. We need to get better at seeing so we can see things with our memories and our imaginations and our feelings attached. So Edward Weston, he is a photographer that was really good at seeing. So do any of you know what this is if you take a look at this? This is actually a photograph by Edward Weston, who was really, like I said, a master at seeing. And he was able to see something really extraordinary in this photograph. It's just a pepper, but he was able to see some things in this piece that maybe not everybody might notice. And he used some special techniques, uh, such as a really a timed exposure for his camera of over two hours, which really means that he set his camera up on a tripod. He opened up the lens and let the light in slowly for over two hours to create this really special glow that he was able to get with this piece. And he also used lighting in a very effective way. He lit the pepper in such a way that really helps to show off the form of the pepper. And does anybody have any ideas about what this might, this form of this pepper might remind you of? Well, really what it is is it's two embracing figures and that's what Weston saw. And actually, if you look at that, you can see that yourself too. So the photo taken that Weston created, it communicates a sense of wonder at the seeing, seeing the things around us, just ordinary things around us. And it also stimulates to participate in the artist's act of seeing here. Seeing is a deeply personal process and not, no two people will see things in the same way because each of us is different. We each have different experiences, different feelings, different um, origins. So confronted with this image of a pepper, some of you might evaluate it differently. Like some of you might just see a pepper, but some of you may actually see it 
um, as embracing figures and see it as being kind of an interesting piece in general. It's a gelatin silver print from 1930, so this is actually a fairly old piece. So form and content. Form, the total effect of the combined, combined visual qualities within an artwork, so pretty straightforward stuff. So that would be the materials that were used. Uh, color, shape, line, design are all part of the form of a piece. The content is actually the message or the meaning of the work of art. And this is what the artist is really trying to express to the viewer. Content determines form and form expresses content. So the two are really inseparable. And one way to better understand the relationship between form and content is to compare works of the same subject. So we'll take a look at two works of the same subject. And we have two of the same subject by two famous artists. This is a kiss, but they differ greatly in form and content. So let's take a look at these. So Auguste Rodin, The Kiss, 1886, out of marble. It's basically close to life size. Um, and it's very realistic. And the one on the left, Rodin's figures, are basically the Western ideas of masculine and feminine. And it also captures the more sensual side of love. And in contrast to this approach, Konstantin Brukansky, The Kiss, 1916, out of limestone, his is a lot different, right? This piece uses the solid quality of block to express the lasting love. So he used really minimal cutting into the stone to really illustrate the concept of two becoming one. And he also uses uh, geometric abstraction. So that is in, you know, if we compare that to Rodin's piece here, he's not using abstraction. This is very representational of the human figures, but this is using that abstraction and that minimal cutting really shows that two have become one. Uh, so this one expresses the content of this piece is expressing love of the enduring kind. So think of that old couple that have been together for like 50 years. That's kind of what is being expressed here. And this one is more the expression and the content of this is the expression of sensual love, of sensuality, of masculine and feminine. So th really the form of these pieces, this is very representational, this is geometric abstraction, the content, more sensual and more lasting love here. So that's how they are contrasting the form and content. Let me check and see what time I have here. Okay, I got a few more minutes. Iconography, we'll move on to iconography. Subject symbols and motif used in an image to convey its meaning and not all works contain iconography. And iconography is really particular to a certain culture or region. So iconography really, each culture has its own set of iconography. So it's very dependent on the culture, the type of iconography that you have. So there's different sets of iconography all over the world, depending on the culture. So this is actually a piece from Japan and it's Buddhist. It's called the Amida Buddha. It's made out of wood. It's from the 17th century, so that means 1600s. Centuries, um, so 17th century, that means 1600s. You just have to kind of remember, you know, it's actually one down from the century anyway. But so this work actually uses a lot of iconographic language. There are a lot of symbolisms here. So the top knot on Buddha, that's his hairdo. That, that is actually a symbolism of enlightenment in Buddhist culture. His garment is simple, which kind of shows that he lived by begging after he became enlightened. His earlobes are stretched from wearing heavy jewels. So that symbolizes that he was once a rich man. And his hands are folded in the traditional uh, position of meditation. And the lotus flower throne that he's uh, sitting on top of symbolizes the fact that enlightenment can come in the midst of life, just as a lo lotus flower may bloom on a stagnant pond. So those are the symbolisms found in this piece. But anyway, I think that pretty much wraps up the lecture videos for this week.